And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple, and we lost one of them. <laughs> In... <laughs> In the what red corner, news? in the red corner, we have Mr. Andy Thomas, and in the blue corner, when he gets back, we have Mr. <laughs> Dave Yeager, the double-headed monster that's spearheading Mystic Days, which will be co which will hey, be covering to which will be covering to day slash tonight, depending on where you are in your time zone. Uh so first, first off, thank you guys for be for being open to coming. Back on, and I'll um. Absolutely. I'll ha we'll have to we'll have to do a bit of catch up when Dave gets back in. <laughs> yes, that, that'll be that, fine. That was that was real. That was some particularly bad timing. <laughs> yes, it was. Mm -hmm. I love the technology. It's a one-sided affair. Yes. Oh, and he's back. Welcome back, Dave. Well, we'll try this again. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> we'll do it live. Okay. So, I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk. I'd like okay. both of you. I'd like each of you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what about it made it stick. And I'll start with you, Andy. Okay. Uh well, uh, my best friend. Um... In best childhood friend um, at the age of about 10 or 11 I guess uh, his dad bought him the magenta box D&D &D. so that takes us back a ways dates us for sure so you know you're talking 1979 ish and mm -hmm. uh, so we, we started playing the basic D&D &D back then and and just loved the idea um, I suppose I you know played some role-playing games um, in quotation marks. If you ever played Clue, I mean, that's kind of a role. There's role-playing in that um, to a degree. Um, even the game of life, you know, you, you take on a, a certain character, so to speak. Um, Let's not forget Clue. And, right. Um, Stop Thief was another game. Now that dates me again. That came out, I think, in 1979. Um, but you, you had a character in that game, you know? So, so when we got D and D, it was just kind of an ex extension of, of some things that we'd already been introduced to on a very basic level. And that just took our imaginations and sent them into a frenzy and we loved it and couldn't get enough of it. And, um, you know, eventually we we were buying the hardcover books, A, D and D and, and, uh, so on and so forth. And then, um, um, Dave and I started playing, um, mm -hmm. probably in the late eighties together. And we, we started playing, um, second edition and we played some of the basic edition to uh, OD and D. And, um, we just, uh, as we played, we discovered things that we didn't think made a whole lot of sense. Um, as a game mechanic, um, we were always looking for ways to make it more realistic and, you know, how you can, you can go overboard with that and just drag the game down to a screeching halt. And, uh, you know, so we did a lot of that too, but in the process of doing that, we eventually came up with our own homebrew rules and we decided, Hey, why don't we just make our own game? And then life happened and, you know, Dave, uh, his life took a different direction and he moved away and we had kids and, you know, 20 some years later, COVID hits and Dave calls me up and says, guess what I found in my basement. <laughs> so mm -hmm. now here we are today, two years later. Yep. So yeah. Yeah. I'll let Dave for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for for me it was a little different because I got the original, you know, the white box set, mm -hmm. probably late seventies, and I couldn't find anybody that wanted to play. So 
until I hooked up with Andy, I hadn't played D and D. You know, I read the white box rules, but I I could never find anybody that wanted to take the time to learn the game. So it wasn't until you know those the early '80s there that that I got into D and D. And yeah, the the imagination is to me it's a way to go. Uh, you know, that that the one pamphlet of of rules you can do go anywhere you want with it. So that that's what I liked about it. And uh, yeah, just with us making our own rules and and uh, just coming up there's are just things. I mean, I still like D and D. We uh, I actually played my first five E at DaveCon. That was the first game of five E that I played, uh, and we had a lot of fun. Andy and I played it with uh, I think Rob Richie was the one that ran that, wasn't it, Andy? Yeah, yeah, and uh, but yeah. So it's not that I dislike D and D. We just disliked a lot of the rules, how they work. So, and that's where it started. And uh, yeah, the last couple of years have been pretty intense, you know, trying to really flesh them out. You know, when you're first trying to figure it out around the campfire, you uh, you come up with things that you think are pretty innovative until you actually look at them. You <laughs> take a good long look and think, oh, wow, that's just a rebranding what was already there, you know. <laughs> so... I guess that brings us to today. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, and I met, I mentioned this to and I mentioned this to Andy when I first spoke with him. Yep. The idea of creating a, of creating a system out of dissatisfaction with with a with a certain rule set, you're in good company. Oh yes, yep. Um, two names that two names that I always bring up whenever I talk with about this kind of thing. At just speaking as a Want to be historian uh, are chivalry and sorcery and role master. All right, both of those were created out of a be, out of a dissatisfaction with the rule set. Uh, role master was originally arms law, which was just a collection of house rules for AD and D, which and then just morphed into its own thing. And um, chivalry and sorcery. The creator of that was dissatisfied with the with the way a medieval culture was portrayed in Dungeons and Dragons, so he did his own thing. Yep. And of course, there's there's others with with games that aren't with games that aren't D and D. But one thing that I that um that you mentioned it you mentioned in quotes on the Kickstarter page that I want to. I, I want to highlight is claim is your guys' claim that this is an old school style game, but it isn't a retro clone. Right. Yes. So yep. what exactly did you guys mean by that? Well, um, basically, it's the game mechanics are not something that we have seen in any role playing game, and. But the the idea isn't new. It's not like we had this grand revelation, you know, on top of a mountain. Um, the roll-off system is what we were referring to there. And you, I haven't seen it anywhere except in games like Talisman or uh, a Risk where every roll is contested. Like in Talisman, I mean, it's a D6. You know, and then, you know, whatever strength or um, craft you have, you add that to it, and whatever magic items and whatever. But the D, the D6 is the dice that you roll, and somebody rolls that D6 against you. So mm -hmm. it's a contested roll whenever you meet a monster or, um, you know, what have you. In Risk, uh, the defender got two dice, and the attacker got three dice, if you had enough armies. So they didn't call it the roll off system, but that's what we call it. Mm -hmm. and, and so essentially you're when, when you come into a combat situation, it's a roll off. You have to roll a higher number on the die that you have along with all of your bonuses and modifiers than the monster rolls along with their modifiers. And, and, and so that, we think is is innovative um 
in the role playing community. Yeah. And there's a little more to it than that in the combat sure. sequence. Um, the roll off is how you decide who wins, but uh, you know, there's, there's, we don't use initiative. There, there's different things that tie into that also. If I may, mm -hmm. um, wh when I had this idea, it was just for combat. My, my idea for, for the roll off system was not for the entire game system. My idea, I, I, it just kind of occurred to me one night thinking about talisman mm -hmm. and how they, you know, how combat happens in, in talisman. And so that was my, that was my catalyst for this was, you know, um, and it was only combat related. And I, and I remember texting Dave that I had this, this great idea about, you know, how to do combat and whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Because essentially, like Dave said, we were just rebranding D&D uh, &D with uh, the way we were doing uh, initiative and to hit. And we were looking for a different way to do it. And um, so after I shared with him my idea and kind of explained it, he said, well, why don't we don't, why don't we do that for everything? To which I paused and and um, my first thought was, well, that's going to be super difficult, <laughs> but we ended up we did it. And so the roll off system isn't just for combat. If if, if your character drinks poison, the poison has a certain power and and there's a certain number of 12 sided dice for example, that you might have to roll. If it's really powerful poison, you might have to roll 5d12 plus 12. And, mm -hmm. and you're only getting to roll the d10 plus any constitution bonus that you have to overcome this poison that your character just drank. So, so now you're rolling off against poison, which sounds crazy, right? But mm -hmm. that's, you know... It, that's what we came up with. So it, magic is the same way. You have to roll off against magic to cast a spell. You can't just zing a magic missile across the room. You first have to harness the energy. And to do that, you have to roll off against magic. The magic die is a D12. And another player can roll that die or the referee can roll that die. Um, and the die that you get to roll is based on your, your wisdom. And... Um, and you have to beat the magic die to mm -hmm. harness that energy. And then once, if you're able to do that, then you have to channel that energy into a spell. And that's a second roll off. And if you win that, then the spell goes off. And, and that all can happen in the, in the course of one or two rounds. But if the, if you lose roll offs in combat, then you don't get to do what you wanted to do. Your opponent, gets to do what they wanted to do. They either are able to defend your blow or they're able to counterattack and stab you in the guts instead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but with magic, if you lose the roll off in magic in mystic days, bad things can happen. We've got all kinds of tables for, for, um, for those things. And each spell has its own table of things that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's that's the that's the big catch that the it's it, it's an old school feel because there are no uh, as Rob Ritchie uh, said there's no baby bumpers on this game your character can die in their very first encounter and when they do die they are dead there are no resurrection spells there are no wish spells uh, we leave resurrection to Jesus <laughs> you're rolling up another character. So, but I digress. Mm -hmm. And since we've got, before we can even go into the nitty gritty of the, of that aspect, um, yeah. I think it's important. I think it's important to cover the most player facing aspect of of do of of doing a character, and that is um, some some of the aspects with character creation. Okay. So the first question that the first question that I have in that regard is, are you guys going for a a um? Are you guys going for classes or are you going more freeform? 
free form. There are no character classes. Yep. Uh, your character development is all skills based. Mm -hmm. you, you only progress in what skills you use. Uh, you know, you're not going to get good at picking locks if if you never pick locks. You're, you're not just going to go up a level and be able to pick locks better. Uh, you've actually got to succeed in picking locks to get better at picking locks. And and that goes with, with any of the skills that they can do. Um, they, they only get good at what they use. Is it a is it a chance to advance kind of thing, so, sort of like basic? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I'm trying to think of how basic did it. Um, um, basic and and rune quest. It's complicated. Um, ha have it that when you get when you have chances to advance, you'd roll against that particular skill, and if you roll o and if you roll over it instead of under, then that skill would increase. Oh no, no, no that's not how we do. Um, every time you use a skill or a specific weapon or cast a specific spell, uh, you get awarded a certain amount of points mm -hmm. for that based on the difficulty degree of what it was you were doing. Uh, in combat, it's, it's, it's a little simpler than that. But um, with, with combat, for instance, if you use a sword... Uh, say you use a longsword, if you make an attack with that longsword, even if you lose the roll-off, you still get a certain amount of points. And once you... We call them dex points for, mm -hmm. for combat, for, for anything uh, involving combat. You'll get dex points. And so once you get 100 dex points, um, then you get better with that weapon. And you, you move up to a higher die that you can use in your roll offs. Does that make sense? Mm hmm. Right. And, um, with, and e even unsuccessful, you earn a certain amount because everybody learns from their mistakes, right? So I'm, I'm guessing you get, <laughs> I'm guessing you guys do subscribe to, to some extent to the concept of fail forward. Yes. 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 Essentially uh, in the combat um, and, and in wizardry, if you, if you, are successful in your attack or defense, or if you are successful in your um, casting of a spell, then you get, say, we'll just use a number just for sake of argument. You'll get ten. You'll get ten points um, mm -hmm. to go toward that spell or that weapon to increase the the, uh, the action die or the channel die. Now, if you're unsuccessful, you'll get half of that so you get so not quite half but you, you know you still get three or four points mm -hmm. so you yes fail uh failing forward is is um, a concept we use there yeah now i've i've always i've always mentioned a a um a design ethos that i call all roads lead to rome okay this site this just that, just speaking as a historian, in the early in the early days, you had a bunch of subsystems, but as time went on, um, the way a lot of games became designed was built on was built on a particular resolution mechanic, and that that's where that's where everything begins and ends. And you do have that to an extent with the roll off, but what I am curious about is with all the different die types that you have. How is how is the how is um how are dice built and you and utilized for ju for just a straight resolu a straight resolution? Are you guys relying on a sum based pool or some or something else? Oh, that's a that's a great question. So the the game includes eleven dice. From D4 all the way up to D24, mm -hmm. and everything in between practically. <laughs> so we've got the D4, D5, D6, D7, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 20, and 24s. But you won't be using all of those dice every turn. For for a, a long portion of your character development, you're going to be stuck at a certain die until you get better, um, mm -hmm. and then you'll go to the next die. 
So say, for instance, you ha your character had a dexterity of 16, I think they would start um, the, the action die that they would start with for combat would be a D5, I believe. I'm just kind of going off the top of my head here. And once they get 100 dex points um, with uh, their chosen weapons, um, that would move up to a D6 for those weapons. Um, and they have the max die that they can get up to, and it might, I think, uh, be somewhere around the D14. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's the same thing with, with um, magic, except... Uh, the, the die that you use to cast spells um, is based on your wisdom scores. So damage will um, will use a, a bit more of the dice um, depending on the type of attack that you use because bludgeon every weapon you can you can use multiple ways and we've We've tried to include as much realism as possible without just dra dragging the game to a screeching halt because the mechanics call for you to do so much math that it takes three hours just to do one round. Mm -hmm. So um, so we, we've narrowed it down as much as we can, we think, to keep it relatively fast. And every weapon can do bludgeoning damage, uh, piercing damage, and slashing damage. Um, but they'll do different amounts of those. Like a club isn't going to do very, it's, you can slash attack with it, but it, you know, it's a club. It does bludgeoning damage. Um, a sword, you could use the flat of your sword. So it could do bludgeoning damage or it could do slashing damage or mm -hmm. it is pointed. So it could do piercing damage. So, and all those damages for that sword are listed right on your character sheet. So all you have to do is look, okay, I can do 3d10 if I just stab the dang thing. Um, you know, you, you might do 1d6 if you, you know, bludgeoning damage. Um, so you'll use different dice in the damage section. But again, you're, you're going only going to have a certain couple of weapons. Most characters, most players only use a couple of weapons anyway with their character. And mm -hmm. they'll get used to those damages that they, the, the dice that they need to roll for those damages, and they're just not going to change. So, does that answer that question, or was that? Yeah. Funny? <laughs> now, earlier you mentioned that when it comes to combat, you guys aren't using initiative. Are right. you guys using a phase based approach instead, or do you have something else in mind? I wouldn't call it phase based. Uh, basically, uh, the, we, we call them the AG, the adventure guide. The, that would be the equivalent to the DM or the GM. And, and uh, he's going to describe what's going on. Uh, you know, if you, you see three goblins and they're running at you. What are you going to do? And, and, and that's as much initiative as you got. You're going to state what you're going to do as a player. And the AG, of course, is going to do what the goblins were going to do. And you do the roll off. And you've got to, once you state what you're going to do, you can't say, well, I'm going to attack. And then once the goblins attack, you say, well, no, I'm going to defend instead. Well, once you state what you're going to do, that's what you got to do. And then you do the roll off and then whoever wins ends up getting to do what they did or what they were planning to do. Uh, just like in real life, you know, and if somebody slashes with a sword, somebody gets hit or somebody doesn't. Um, you're both, you're both attacking at the same time or attacking and defending. It's, it's, it's not static. Like that's what we didn't like about initiative. You roll initiative and he hits while that guy stands there and then that guy hits while you stand there yeah we just never like that it's it's always you know sometimes you might both hit uh sometimes you might defend and, and make it you might defend and you don't and he still hits you or you might mm -hmm. you know so so that's kind of how it works it's not really a <laughs> The, the phase, I, I know what you're talking about, and I, I don't think that falls into the same categories how they did the phases. Um, yeah, I've I, never I, actually played. Go ahead, Andy. Um, no, the, we, we discussed doing the, the phases, um, but we, we just weren't, um, 
we didn't hate it, but we just didn't we didn't like it enough to incorporate it. So we we came up with as free form an idea as you can come up with. Like Dave said, that the the uh, AG and the referee he'll describe the encounter, and then he's going to ask you, "What are you doing?" and mm-hmm. And he will tell you what the monsters are doing or what the enemy is doing as well. And that might seem kind of odd to know what the monster is going to do, you know. Um, However, you have to win the roll off to do what you want. So everybody states what they they want their character to do. and, And the referee tells them what the monsters are doing. And then, like Dave said, they roll off. But there is a combat economy that we've incorporated with the speed attribute. Not everybody's as fast as everybody else. One guy might have three actions with the weapon that he has per round, whereas the monster might only have two actions. So Mm -hmm. once you've expended your actions, you're out of actions for the round, and anybody that has more actions than you is going to get to continue to attack. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have to, and every there's, there's different moves that, that cost two, two actions and there's quicker moves that only cost one action. Um, They might not do as much damage, but it's a faster move. And so you have to keep those things in, in perspective and, and in mind when you're announcing your actions for the round, because if you lose the roll off and you expended all your actions and the other guy still has actions left, you could be in serious trouble. But um, everybody gets to use two actions at a time. So if somebody has three actions, they can't use them all. So it is kind of a phase, but it's really that's that's a it's a phase system in the i would say in the loosest um terms Mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah and for what for what it's worth when i refer to the phase um thing rollmaster has kind of done has kind of done that and it's one of those things that's a it's an art it's a artifact of the wargaming roots you know where you had where you had the shooting phase, then you had a charge phase, then melee. Okay. Um, and it was a case where it it wasn't ev- it wasn't individual participants taking turns. It was everybody who, everybody who everybody would declare an action, and then they'd go, and then those actions would resolve in that order of um, phases with everybody. I'm so it would vastly be kind of like that. Then yeah. I'm vastly simplifying, of course. Right. Sure. Right. But. Now, sent now. Given that, of course, the other thing that I could that didn't escape my notice is the unique um, die types that are that are throughout the that are throughout the book. Um, okay. What prompted the What prompted the idea of all, of all those different die types for one, and with some with some of them, especially die types with odd numbers. Um, how would someone roll that? Because someone might look at a D7 and like, how am I going to do this? Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, essentially, the I would say the initial, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but I would, I would say the initial thought process there was that we wanted to expand the amounts of damage different weapons did we wanted to give a little bit more differentiation between say um a dagger and a short sword and a long sword and a broad sword and a spear and and um yeah that was the, i think the initial um impetus there and and we wanted as you increased uh, you know, a lot of times uh, you, you go to an increase and then it's still a D6, but now it's a plus four or a plus five or so then you never have a minimum. Your, your minimum roll then is all of a sudden a five. Uh, there's no such thing as a roll of a one or a two or a three anymore. Mm-hmm. And by going with the different dice, it still kept you to where you could stumble and fall on your sword, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, and and. 
part of the, uh, the the set is I don't know if you're familiar with the dungeon uh, the dungeon crawl. Games. I am. That's that's the set they use, except they actually use a thirty uh, and a three along with those. If if you buy their set, you get a thirty and a three with it, along with mm-hmm. that uh, the percentile dice. You know the the ten through ninety. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but that was that was part of the idea for that that I was thinking about is just you start using the same dice and just keep adding pluses to it and then all of a sudden you don't have any low rolls, you know your minimum roll is a six even though you're you're rolling a d six, <laughs> so where by increasing by the dice you still got the rolls of one and two and three and you know, mm-hmm. and, and that was the same with armor class you know in the. In the D and D, the part we didn't like about armor class was just you got to the point where you couldn't even be hit. You know, you could just sit there and hold the head of the goblin, and no matter what he did, he could never hit you. And that just or <laughs> God, God help you if you do, if you unironically decided to play a ranger back in those days, or even nowadays, the ranger is eternally snake bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. If. If you did, if you did play a ranger in those in those days, I'm not bullying you. I'm just tell, I'm just telling the truth. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, oh. I, you know, I remember what what was the mage in D and D a D four life? Yeah. I think. You know. And Im- imagine imagine the look of absolute despair when you roll that D four, and after all the effort of either starting out or leveling up, all you get is one hit point. Yeah, and you can't yes. wear armor. <laughs> right, and your armor class is ten. Yeah, right? mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah, that's an, that's another thing that we don't have is armor class. It's um, you we use a damage reduction system for armor, and anybody can wear armor, and mm-hmm. there's no character classes. So and and we don't level up your character; they just get better. It's skill based, so you can have that spell casting lock picking tracking gnome that makes armor if you want mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, you can do practically whatever you want with your character you're not pigeonholed um into a certain character class that yet yeah, you can only get good at what it is your character class is so and Given given what you mentioned about about armor and the relationship with armor class, um, is is there is there a sk- is there a skill to mit- to mitigate or at least or at least make it easier to wear he- to wear heavier armor? Um, actually, no, we don't have anything for that specifically. Um, you can make um, if you take the the armor smith special skill you can make better armor um that will protect it will have a better protection value um you know than um say just a basic standard set of chain mail um but no to to your question no we don't have anything specifically for that that's a good question though yeah that yeah. That, that we're gonna have to take notes on that. We yep. we might uh, we might have to incorporate something like that. That sounds like a good idea. Um, I rem- I remember I remember Anima had had a had a wear armor stat that determined the heaviest ca- the heaviest kind of armor you could wear without getting penalized, as well as how quickly you could get in and out of armor. And as somebody who's worn armor in the past, it's not something that you can get <laughs> you can get in and out of all that easily. <laughs> No, no, or quickly. And Lord help you if you ever have to wear plate in the middle of summer. <laughs> That's a hell I wouldn't wish on anyone. No. Oh. <laughs> of course, it didn't exactly help that. In, in my case, they were they were used to they were used to putting armor on shorter people. I am not oh. a short man. So they had to reach for the straps. Yeah. <laughs> needed a stool. <laughs> I think I think it took I think it took me about I think it took them about fifteen minutes to get everything on. Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, normally it's supposed to take around fi- around five if people know what they're doing, but again, 
That's if. Right. right. But when it comes now, given given the given the um, talk of believability, which is my mantra over realism, with combat, I'm curious what advantages or disadvantages you guys give to reach weapons. Oh, yes. Yep. You're going. <laughs> I, I think um, players will find a fresh love for pole arms. Yes. Because the the longer weapons have a every weapon has a reach bonus. And we we base that roughly on the the length of the weapon in feet. Basically every foot gets a plus one. And and of course any game mechanic will probably break down eventually when you when you get right down to brass tacks and and try try to compare it to reality but um every weapon basically has a plus one for every length in feet that it is so a six foot long weapon has a plus six reach bonus so that's that's one of the modifiers that you will add uh, during your attack phase, um, essentially there's there's four. You've got your your action die, which could be um, we'll just say a d7 for instance. Um, then you have a speed bonus. Um, hopefully you have a speed bonus. If your <laughs> if your character is fast enough, they'll have a speed bonus, and that would modify um, that d7. And then if they're proficient with that that weapon that would be a third or a second modifier rather and then the third modifier would be the reach bonus um and of course if they found a magic weapon that might give them another bonus but with mm -hmm. um just for sake of argument that those those three are always going to be there um and that reach bonus is is big because if you have a um a pole arm that has a plus nine reach bonus you might only have an action die of a d7 and your opponent has an action die of a d12 well that's a five point difference but they're using a dagger well now now things just you know the tables have turned so mm -hmm. um yeah we we really like the reach bonus yeah we really yeah. do we, we we think that really adds adds a, a, a unique flavor and twist on combat that uh, that brings me to something else that has been a contentious issue with how with how some get with how some games have handled it. Let's talk about dual wielding. We don't even address it in our game. Mm -hmm. We we don't have a rule for it. Um, so there's no pay not to suck when it comes to someone who wants to wield a couple of short swords. Well, they will still only have so many so many actions they can do in a round and and that's dependent upon uh, their speed as to how many actions they can do in a round so whether they're wheeling i mean if they want to wield an axe and a sword they can but they're still right. only going to be able to do so many actions and they'll have to decide what what they're doing on what what action which with which weapon i mean we, we don't have specific rules for it but we don't preclude the possibility of, of using it yeah that I'm perfectly that I'm perfectly fine with. Yeah. Um, I'm more I'm more when I when I when I say contentious when it comes to dual wielding, I'm more referring to games that decide to use that to impose penalties or or the or the like that om that almost discourage it unless you're building entirely around it. Oh uh, no! If you yeah. want to dual wield in Mystic Days, we, there's no penalty to that. Right. No, I would say I would, say, I would say the penalty will come when um, you are in a position where you wish you would have had a shield because the shield bonus is plus four, plus eight, and plus twelve respectively for the three different size shields that we have. Mm -hmm. So the 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 plus eight is a is a standard size shield. That's a very good bonus when you're just trying to defend against an attack. Right. Where 
you know, your, your dual wielding weapons, um, you're not going to have a plus eight with most of those weapons that, well, with any of them, because you're not going to, you're not going to dual wield with a two handed weapon. You, I mean, a halberd, you're not, you, you, right. you have a great reach bonus with a halberd, <laughs> but you can only use one of them, you know? Right. So you can dual wield, but, um, the, the drawback, the penalty, the penalty will will be when you find yourself in that situation that you wish you would have had a shield instead. Mm-hmm. But if you want to defend, but you've got a state you're going to defend right. before that shield's going to help you. Yeah. Just because just you well, have yeah. one isn't going to help you if you're not stating I'm I'm going to defend. <laughs> right. Exactly. If if you state you're going to attack, then the shield bonus doesn't get added into your role. You're attacking, and if you lose that, then and the other guy was attacking, then. Sorry, sucks to mm-hmm. be you. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. The dice That's gods it. giveth and they taketh away. Yes. Yes, yeah. they do. Yeah. Um. Now we've, when it comes to magic, we dipped into it a little bit, but I'd like to go a little further into what you guys have planned when it comes to, when it comes to magic, and I'm get I'm. I'll start with the question of whether or not you guys have. You guys are planning a defined list of spells, or if it's a collection of eff- if you have a collection of effects and people are going to be building um, spells. Both, both, yeah. We 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 have oh I can't remember sixty some spells right now. Is that what it well, is? Well, we we actually have three hundred, but we have sixty of them fleshed out. Um, right fully um the other the the rest of them are are in the process of just of getting flesh fleshed out Mm -hmm. but every spell is is customizable basically so if you want if you want to cast a a fireball uh it depends how much energy you put into that and and that will that will dictate how much damage the fireball does. Um, so anybody can cast a fireball as you can cast a fireball as a very first spell that you ever cast. Um, once you learn how to harness energy, uh, in the rules, um, and, and your, your character is able to do that. They can try to cast it practically any spell that they want. If they have enough energy points to do that, um, and then it's, you know, all bets are off and, and hopefully you win the roll because fireballs are dangerous. If you lose that roll off, you, you could toast yourself and the rest of your companions and it's a total party kill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. you, you want to, so there's, there's a lot of, uh, magic economy that you want to take into consideration too, right. but, but yeah, the spells are defined, but there we've, we've tried to give them, um, a framework with which they can customize those spells. Mm-hmm. Plus, we also have the framework that they can try anything they want. And there's a set, we kind of have a set amount of energy points per hit point of damage you want to do, per square foot of area you want to cover, per distance away you want to cover. And uh, anything is permissible that the referee wants to permit in his game. Uh, of course, there's going to be some stuff right. people want to try that the referee is just going to say no. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. You know, um, but we've got the framework that they can try absolutely anything they want. If they can think it up and and, and, and put it down on paper, they can try it. But mm-hmm. uh, magic has a consequence. It always has a consequence. And if it's successful, it, it happens how you were wanting to do it. If if it isn't successful, like Andy said, it could be a total party kill. Uh, it could be funny. There, there's a lot of mishaps. Uh, so first starting out, when you're low on your, your magic dice, when you're when you're rolling lower dice, you probably want to try smaller spells. That, right. That's kind of our mechanic to keep people from going too wild with magic because when it goes wrong, it can really go wrong. Mm-hmm. So... That that's kind of a what we thought would be a, a way to kind of rein back people from getting too powerful too quick. But we 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 haven't made it to where they can't try it if they don't want to. You know, if, if they want to try it, that, that's fine. 
<laughs> and I was going I was going to ask if the spells are fi are fire and forget but you pr you more or less answered that. Okay. Um uh, Now when it comes to given the fact that you talked that you talked about how much energy you're putting into a spell, I think it's safe to say that you guys aren't doing the concept of spell levels and charges the way more ubiquitous games do it. Correct. Correct. Yes. In fact, um we think that you can end up casting more spells with a beginning character than any other game because it's it's um, an energy point cost for the, for the spell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for instance, a, a healing spell has a, a hundred energy point um, base cost, and then there's ten points for every point of life that you want to heal so if you want to heal 10 points of damage then that's going to cost another 100 energy points so that would be a 200 energy point spell and the minimum amount of energy points available that a, that a spell casting character will start with i believe is 1500 off the top of my head so you could cast quite a few different healing spells whereas with um and I'll just say D&D, &D just because I'm very familiar with D&D, &D, but, um, and I, I'm not saying it to put down D&D. &D. I love D&D. &D. It introduced me to, to all this great, fantastic medieval fantasy role-playing stuff. Yeah. But the cleric, the beginning cleric, I think, had what, one or two spells that they could cast, and once they cast them, they're done. So, and, and I think it was a D8 for, um, for the, uh, the hit points that they could heal. So, in Mystic Days, you're beginning spellcaster, and there's no since there's no classes, there's no differentiation between a wizard or a cleric. Your beginning spellcaster could cast a, a healing spell that could heal fifty points or more. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty powerful. But but if it goes if wrong, it could goes. also suck fifty points out of him. So or worse. <laughs> no, right. Or worse. Or worse. So, <laughs> so you want to you want to use those those sparingly you, you probably if, if you use a, a the less energy point that you use the less that can go wrong if it does go wrong so you want to be careful with that but um anyway i, I digress did, did that answer that question yeah so to put in to put into a bit of practice let's let's consider let's consider a few classics and how one might do the equivalent um, casting within your system, both the both the effects and the ca and the casting itself. Okay. A lot of people like to use fireball for their example and this kind of thing. I'm gonna go a little different route. Okay. Um. How how would some how, let's say somebody wanted to have the equivalent of ray of frost. Okay. okay. Which I'm totally not saying because of the fact that it's cold half the year where I am. <laughs> but it a single a single target spell that's a single target spell that's treated like a missile attack and uh, and deals cold damage. Okay. So how would something like that resolve itself okay. in Mystic Days? Uh that's a great question. I'm it it would it would be a there would be a base cost for us for a spell like that we, and we do have we do have a cold spell uh we don't have an actual ray of frost but you would base it off of that spell yeah um and use that base cost and then however much damage you wanted to 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 uh cause um it would take a multiplier of 10 in energy points. So for every point of damage you want to cause, it's just like healing. Every point of damage you want to heal, you got to use 10 energy points. Mm -hmm. Every point of damage you want to cause, you got to use 10 energy points. So you just do the math by 10 there. And then if it's a distance, the, um, the distance is one energy point per foot. So however far the, the opponent is away from you, if, if, all you have to do is touch it, then there's no cost there. 
you got to do a little bit of math and you can do that spell. Mm-hmm. And then you got to roll off and hopefully it goes off well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so. I'm just thinking fire off the top of my head. I think it's 250 base cost. So you'd so have that the sounds two, right. The 250 plus 10, 10 energy points you'd have to put in up per point of damage you'd want to do. And then one energy point per foot away from wherever you're casting it to, whoever you're casting it at. Mm-hmm. And obviously, I w- obviously I wouldn't expect the exact named spell in this, but so- but something that does the same effect is what I was shooting for with this ki- with this kind of thing. Now, I think it's called. I think it's just basic. Uh, I think we called it frost. Mm-hmm. I think we did. I'm, I'm looking right now. See if I can. Um, find it. Th- like fireball is is classified under fire, right? It's just, and there's there's multiple things yeah. that you can do with the fire spell. If you just want to start a candle on fire, you can just light the candle. Um, obviously, you're going to cost a lot less for that one. Right. Um, but there's there's four specifics under fire. Um, frost, I think it's just I, I think we only just have the frost spell. But then you can go off of that and do whatever you want, and you mm-hmm. can make a, the ray of frost that you talked about. Right. Yeah, and I'm guessing that there. I'm guessing that there's that you could use that spell for other, for other means, like enchanting a weapon with frost, or a te- sure. or changing the AOE from a single target to, uh, to some to some sort of burst or multiple tar- or target yeah. multiple people at once. Right. Well, oh, yeah. or you, yes. you can do it in a cubic foot area, square foot area, depending on the type of spell it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've got uh, rules in place for that. Uh, how many energy points per square foot for, I think it's per 10 square foot, isn't it? Yeah. One EP per 10 square foot extra. Uh, I can't yeah. remember off the top of my head, but, but yeah, the, we, we have, we have rules in place to, to cover any of that, that they want to try. Mm-hmm. And something I know, something I noticed, I either, this is either this is either something that I, that is present or I di- or I skip or I skipped it, um, okay. but I don't unless I'm mistaken. You guys don't have an equivalent to criticals. No, no, we we don't. No, um, I I suppose well perhaps we do. Now that I think about it, because we we break the the body down into we call them life points hit points life points what we call them in mystery mm-hmm. days same thing um it's the life of your it's the lifeblood of your character how many points do they have so we break those down into into the six body part areas basically so you, your arm has each arm has 10 percent of whatever your total life points are and your torso has 40 percent. your legs have 15 percent each and your head neck area has 10%. So if you have a, a character, and we'll do just real easy math so we don't have to round up and all that stuff. We've got the rules for that. But say you have a character with 60 hit points, 60 life points. Six of those life points would be in their head. Mm-hmm. So if you take a targeted strike to the head for six points of damage, you know, say you get hit with a club or an, an axe, your character's dead. But you say, oh, I still have 54 life points. N- yeah, sure, the rest of your body, but you are you just took a, a head shot. So that's, that I, I guess could be looked at as a, an equivalent to the critical hits, is the targeted strikes that we have. You can target the leg and you can take it, because if you chop a leg, or break a leg, uh, you know, you cause enough damage to a limb, you can take that opponent out, and you don't have to kill them. You mm-hmm. just, the idea in combat is to just neutralize your opponent. <laughs> you don't have to kill them to zero life points. But if you hit them in the head, which there's some negative modifiers to your role, so it makes it a little bit harder. But if you do, if you cause enough damage, then that's an instant kill. So, and of course, if they have armor, the, there's a chance their armor will will protect them too. Uh, which right, which gives you cause to ha- wear a helmet. 
<laughs> put, put the brain basket on. Yeah, although um, my, I remember, I remember my, I remember the time that my players learned to, learned a very valuable lesson when wear when it came to wearing armor in a duel. Um, make sure to have a cup. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. I'm pretty sure both of you have seen the the classic Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Yep. Yes. Do you remember the whole thing about the about rules in a knife fight? Oh uh. boy, you're taking me. I haven't watched that movie since 19 whatever. My gosh, no. It well, refresh my memory though. Butch gets Butch gets challenged for le for leadership of the gang, and he he just before he's about to start, he, go, he goes, "Hang on a sec, we got to get the rules right." And his opponent's like, "There's no rules in a knife fight," and then he immediately gets kicked in the nuts. Oh, <laughs> well, there's no, well, there's no, well, there's no rules. There's no, pro there's no problem with starting right now. Yeah, ba <laughs> it's basically a case of there are no, there are no dirty tactics in a fight. Yep. There are just tactics that win. Yep. Yes, and we do have the groin strike as a possible action in combat. In mm -hmm. hand to hand. Yep. Well, well, in any combat, you can use a hand to hand. Yes. If you don't want to use your weapon, you can always smack them in the face or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yes, you you can kick someone in the in the jewels if yep. you would like. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're if you win that roll off, they are going down. Yep. Unless they're a vampire, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, right. If you kick a vampire in the nuts, you deserve what's going to happen. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Of course, th of course, that's r that's rich coming from from the coming from the person who's le who's last the last time he made a martial character. His whole thing is, I'm going to f I'm going to find a way to gr to grapple everything and suplex them, up to and including <laughs> bears. Oh boy, yeah, that uh, probably didn't end well, did it? Actually, it ended very well because he because first off he was a half orc. Second off, his strength was ridiculous, so he was able to pick up and suplex a bear. <laughs> no kidding. Well, kudos to you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sometimes, sometimes I just get dumb ideas, and then I'm thinking, and then I go, you know what? I'm gonna run with that. Um, uh, but what are you guys shooting for as far as a page count for the three volumes? Um, the player's book, the adventure guide, and creatures and coins. Uh, the adventure guide, which is the first one that went through the editing stage and we realized that we have no idea how to use commas <laughs> right dave's oldest daughter nicole is um she went she went to college to be a school teacher and so she offered to edit these and um yeah, and english he, major yes yes so she she asked dave at, at some point if we were afraid of commas <laughs> but <laughs> But uh, she she did the the adventure guide first, and I'm working on putting her fixes in there right now. And that book right now has 104 pages. Right. The next book that she's working on is the player's book. Um, and that's and the smallest, that, I think, isn't it? Yeah, that book has somewhere in the neighborhood right now of 80 pages. <laughs> And then Creatures and Coins, we have not sent that one to her because there's still some things about the magic items and stuff that we're putting in there mm -hmm. that we haven't wrapped up. Um, but that one has right now in the neighborhood of 110 pages. So uh, that will end up being the, the thickest volume because we got the monsters and the magic all in that one book. Right. Mm-hmm. So about three hundred pages total between yeah. all three books, pretty close. Yeah, which is pretty standard fare. It's about mm -hmm. it's about what I would expect for something of this magnitude. Yeah, but I but for me personally, I'll be looking forward to seeing how how it de how it develops. And with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play around here. Oh no problem, and Th thanks for waiting for me to to uh, hook up in here. You know, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry that there was the hang up. Well, that's that's technology, and, yeah. and uh, 
you know, you, you have to love and hate it. But um, we, we just think it's it's a, a blessing and an honor to, to be on your show. Um, and we're just thrilled to that you made time for us right. to, yep. to let us talk about Mystic Days. And, and um, I, I've really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And yep. any anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. Oh, cool. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, have a drink on me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yep. of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>